All right, Chair Pitts, looks like we've tested everyone's mic and we can see them, so you are good to go. <laughs> Begin the meeting now? Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, board members and members of the public. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Logan Pitts, the chair of the Board of Community Services. And joining us today, we also have Vice Chair Terry Griffin, board members Carol Quant, uh, Carolina Spence, Steve Spellman, and Guido Boccalioni. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I don't think Madonna is with us unless I missed her. Looking like she's, she's absent. OK. Um, we also have our host today. Uh, that is Allison Rawson and Jackie Hammond from the city. Uh, the host will coordinate comments from the public and assist during the meeting and take any notes for follow-up needs. Um, panelists and presenters, please silence your cell phones and keep microphones muted if not speaking. Uh, members of the public joining this meeting will have webcams off and microphones muted. If you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during public comment, uh, for privacy concerns, we'll rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your number. And the city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Let's be nice to each other. Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitt. At each agenda item, the item will be presented, the chair will ask for board comments or questions, and then at the appropriate time, open the floor for public comments. The hosts will lower all hands until the public comment item is open. Once the chair has called for public comment, the chair will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on the specific agenda item. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on those who have raised their hands. Public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Email public comments received by the deadline have been distributed to the Board of Community Services members and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received will not be read into the record. Thank you. With that, I call this March 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.05 p.m. And pursuant to government code section 45953E and the recommendation of the health officer of the County of Sonoma, uh, Board of Community Services members will be participating in today's meeting via Zoom. Board members and staff are participating from our remote locations and we are practicing appropriate social distancing. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Host, may we have a roll call please? Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitt. Yes. Vice Chair Griffin. Here. Board Member Spillman. Yes. Board Member Quant. Here. Board Member Cruz. Board Member Spence. Here. Board Member Boclioni. Here. Let the record reflect that six board members are present with the exception of board member Cruz. Thank you. I'd like now to go to agenda item three and open the floor for public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, this is the time when anyone may address the board on matters not listed on the agenda, but are within the subject matter of our jurisdiction. Host, do we have any public comments? Yes. Thank you, I have please call the first speaker. Speaker John W, you, have, you may speak now. Thank you, uh, I didn't realize only the W was there. My name is John Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. I reside at 2037 Orchard Street here in Santa Rosa. And I wanna speak uh, to a non, or making a non-agenda appearance 
on the uh, matter of the refurbishing uh, uh, at Fremont Park. Uh, the survey, as uh, I understand it, has recently been extended to gather public input as to what uh, our citizens would like to see in the way of improvements to the park. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I, it's my opinion and uh, that of a number of other folks that I've talked to uh, on this matter is that it's deeply flawed. Uh, there was absolutely no mention of refurbishing the fountain, uh, the yew trees, or any of the other uh, specific elements that currently exist in the park. The park has a very old historical heritage uh, to it, and it was just absolutely left out of the survey. And so uh, what I would like to ask the board to do and uh, uh, the staff, uh, perhaps, is to uh, uh, redirect the uh, the uh, consultant or architect that has been retained for this matter to redraw, redraft the survey and include uh, uh, elements that are currently in the park, refurbishing or, or repairing the fountain and so on. I, I don't know what happened, but that certainly just seems to me a, a, a gross oversight. And I would, uh, I'd ask the board to direct staff to, to redo that survey. So thank you in advance for your consideration of this uh, matter. And I will, uh, I'll sign off now. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have no further uh, comments. Thank you, host. Our next item is item four, the approval of minutes. Are there any edits or corrections to the minutes from February 23rd? Carol, go ahead. Um, there's one, th these are the draft minutes. I don't know if we got finished ones, but we have, at least on my copy, two separate ending times, one at 5.33 and one at 6.10. Um, I don't know if this is a boilerplate and one just didn't get um, deleted. Uh, I, I was also wondering if the minutes have gotten a little leaner in the last year. They, they, um, they don't seem to have a lot of information and I don't know if that's because all of the meetings are currently recorded, which is better documentation, or if it's just a, a staff change. Thank you. And so uh, thank you, uh, board member Quant. Um, we did have an update to the minutes. So we had, it was very light. Originally we had an update to the minutes uh, to include additional information and clarification. So they were a draft. I'm gonna check in with our host to see if we were able to get that posted. We host Ross and to see if we were able to get the information reposted. Do we need to hold off on, on that approval then, Jen, till the next meeting? Let's to get see that. if we got, um, if we were able to get the update prior to this meeting. The update was um, re-sent out to the board members, um, I believe yesterday, it got re-sent out. My apologies for downloading the wrong copy. It's okay. It, it, it happened, so uh, the updated, uh, Minutes are more like what you're used to seeing. Lots of information in there and uh, public comments as well. And so- For some reason, the, the link in that agenda sent out yesterday is not working for me right now. I okay. feel like it was working like 10 minutes ago, but- We can hold off and adopt them at the next meeting, if that would be better. Okay. That, they, you, everyone has a chance to read them and make sure it's, you know, there's nothing uh, hypercritical in there. We, can, we should just wait so that everyone has a chance. Yep. No rush to approve minutes, so we will make sure those are correct and uh, work on that at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Carol, for flagging that. Any other edits or corrections to February minutes? All right, seeing no other ones, we will uh, table that for now and come back to that. Uh, agenda item five, upcoming events and reports on accomplished events. Deputy Director Santos. Please provide your report. Thank you, Chair Pitts. And uh, if you looked at your upcoming 
events and accomplishments. We have a lot of information on there. I'll, um, I just wanted to update uh, the board on the upcoming event for South Davis Neighborhood Park. We're going to start the process of engaging with the community about uh, replacing the playgrounds there, but also asking the community at the same time, is there anything else we should be looking at for future improvements there at that same time? So that's exciting. And since it's tomorrow, I wanted to make sure I made that announcement. Um, but there's also lots of other exciting, really cool upcoming things since we are kind of um, slowly drifting out of the pandemic restrictions. Uh, you'll see, you can see a lot of things going on with recreation and parks. There's just lots of things going on. And as far as accomplishments, uh, just a reminder that the soccer season has started and we're, we have a bunch of permits. We have 12 organizations and clubs signed up, um, 800 adult players, 2000 youth players. This is one of our most sought after uh, spaces is uh, soccer and baseball fields in the city by far, uh, as far as members and only <laughs> Uh, just barely probably beating out pickleball, depending on uh, who you ask and what day you ask. But those are the some of the pop, most popular uh, sports fields we have. So I wanted to give that reminder to the board and, and definitely check out the accomplishments and upcoming events. There's a lot of information on it. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Jen. Any questions for Jen from the board? Terry. Thank you. Um, Jen, I just wanted to say, I so appreciate the hyperlinks in this document. It really, it's so helpful for me as a board member and I'm sure to members of the public that can access this information through our agendas to have direct links to the activities and all the different things going on. So I really appreciate that addition. That was it. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other comments from the board? Okay. Thank you again, Jen. We'll move on to the next item, uh, your director updates. All right, thanks again, Chair Pitts. I uh, just have a few updates tonight. Uh, just to uh, take it a step back to February and a little reminder that we opened up Colvin Creek Neighborhood Park. Um, if you haven't been there yet, feel free to stop by. It's a brand new playground out there. It's really uh, attracting a lot of attention and fun from the neighborhood. And an update that the bids for those management companies that are interested in managing the Bennett Valley Golf Course are due tomorrow. And we had a good turnout at our uh, mandatory bid walk of interested companies. So I'm very excited. I hope we get a lot of proposals to operate the golf course. The next step is that we'll go through the review committee for review, which includes a council member, uh, staff members, and a member of the golfing community. Uh, and they'll go through and review that, have interviews, and then uh, look for a recommendation to council uh, in June for that. And then the um, Fremont Master Plan uh, started a, a few months ago, and we are we have extended the most latest recent survey till March 31st. And if needed, we can extend it again. Um, it's one of many surveys to come uh, to start that process with that community. Um, we're anticipating that that process will probably take about a year um, or less. It takes a while to get all the comments, especially uh, when you've got some really um, divergent views about what should be happening with the park. Um, it takes some time to work with the community to see um, if we can find some common ground with that park. So that's been kicked off and we'll extend, we'll, that'll be extended to March 31st. And again, we'll extend it again if needed. Um, and um, we anticipate many future surveys with this park. And um, also council recently approved the two fire damage, uh, the two remaining parks uh, fire recovery projects. It's the six fire damage parks, as well as the roadway recovery uh, landscape project. So council approved the construction um, agreements this month, and we are looking to go out to construction very soon with that. The public works engineering team will be managing the day-to-day -day process of the oversight of the construction for that. And those have been a long time coming. So I was really happy to see them get approved at council. Uh, we'll be impro improving most of the landscaping along Fountain Grove Parkway, as well as the roadway landscape, some of the roadway landscaping in the Coffee Park neighborhoods. 
And then the six fire damaged parks are all, most of the parks up are in the, around Fountain Grove that were damaged. They had little bits of damage to each of them. So we combined them into one project for, um, for, in order to expedite that project. And so those should be uh, coming up soon. One of the major pieces of replacement for the six fire damaged parks is the playground replacement at Fur Ridge Park. So we're really looking forward to that process getting started. And uh, we are still continuing with our budget process. It, it, it starts January-ish and it doesn't really end until council makes an approval. So staff are always busy working on the budget process. And I wanted to check one more thing. Uh, just a reminder that um, Gabe Osborne is the public works director, acting director right now for three months. And then after that, it will be Joe Schiavone. Uh, just a little reminder that I was hoping he was hoping to attend tonight, so I'm hoping he can jump on at some point in the future and, and listen in. We're really excited to have Gabe um, on board, even if it's only for three months. So that is the end of my updates. Thank you, Jen. Any questions from the board? Carol. Uh, Jen, excuse me if I missed this. I was trying to find myself in the agenda. The um, Fire damage parks, are they being repaired with Measure M money? Did you discuss that? Uh, no, I did not discuss that. So yeah, I, I can answer that though. Yes, some of the funds from Measure M uh, will be used to fund those. So it'll be used to fund uh, the gap fundings. We have FEMA funding uh, slash Cal OES. We have some donations that are going towards uh, some of the parks in Fountain Grove. And then whatever is remaining, the Measure M funds will come and uh, fill that gap. Council approved the first two years worth of funding, subtracting all the other uh, expenses we had to be allocated towards that um, as needed. So we are in the process of doing that. The reason I ask is I, for one, am always pleased when I'm driving down the freeway and I see your Caltrans dollars at work. I don't know if there's any thought of putting up uh, your Measure M dollars being applied to? Yes, on a, on a, so, uh, on a countywide basis, we've had the discussion on whether or not to do that, but there is going, there are gonna be, there's gonna be a permanent sign at the park when it's done to say that um, your Measure M funds were used at this park for the recovery. Um, during construction, probably not, but um, after construction, there'll be a permanent sign there. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Jen, I had one question. Are you able to provide an update on the plaque at Flat Rock Park? Sure, yes, I, I did have that on my list and forgot about that. So thanks for the reminder. Um, so in speaking with the city manager's office about Flat Rock, it's very similar to what I, um, what I said last time is that it really, um, the concept of what to do with a plaque that may be somewhat, may be considered inappropriate, um, is um, a discussion that's citywide. There's all kinds of discussions about um, signage and, and a variety of things throughout the city. So this uh, project, while you know, the discussion topic uh, for us is originating parks, it will be um, traveling to the city manager's office and they will be uh, deliberating on what our next step should be. It will likely end up with our diversity, equity, and inclusion team uh, for discovery, but as I have updates from the city manager's office on process, I'll be circling back to this board with those updates on on whatever gets decided going forward. But meanwhile, it it you know it we're probably not going to talk about it much more here. It'll go on to the city manager's office, uh, but I will keep you all updated. Thank you for keeping us updated and for advancing that forward. Okay, we will now move on to our scheduled items unless there were any other questions. All right, scheduled items. So we have a new one. Agenda item seven is something um, that is new on our agenda. And we are gonna ask each board member uh, every month to give a brief update. And this is gonna be relevant to rec and parks. So we wanna keep this focused on something that is absolutely an intersection with rec and parks, not tangential. Let's try to keep it positive. If you ever have a critique or complaint, um, Jen is always happy to take those directly. Uh, so let's try to keep this, keep it positive. Um, 
And the other thing that I want to do in this monthly agenda item is I'm going to challenge all the board members to go to a new park every month and report back which park you went to. And if you didn't go to one, it's okay. You won't get your gold star, but I want everyone to discover new parks because um, we have a lot of them. So I'll kick it off this month. Normally I'd go last, but I'll just give an example this month of, of what I'm hoping to see from folks. So uh, what I did this month related to Rec and Parks was went to another uh, park a month cleanup at Rincon Valley Community Park. It was great to uh, get out there and help. Uh, I've helped plant one tree. I can't take too much credit there. I think we had 26 trees planted there. I remember Carol, you asked at the end of the day. Um, and I got to redo the baseball diamond there. So put uh, some dirt down. I didn't think we'd be able to finish that, but many hands makes light work. So we got that done. Um, so that's my example of my update for the month. Um, and then the other thing I'll say, my new parks that I went to, I went to two new parks this month. I went to Nagasawa Park, which I'd never really been to. Um, that's a beautiful park. It's got a nice lake. Might take the kayak out there next time. And I also went to Harvest Park uh, off of Santa Rosa Avenue and my dog uh, very much enjoyed the dog park there. So those, that is my board member update. And I'm gonna call on folks. Um, and if you don't have an update, that's okay. Um, but I really, again, would encourage everyone to, to try to visit a new park at the least. So we'll go first to our vice chair, Terry, do you have an update this month? I do, actually. I also attended the um, Arbor Day celebration at um, Rankin Valley Community Park, which was wonderful. I was so impressed with the turnout and um, with the park staff uh, that attended. Um, I ended up painting benches, which was great, <laughs> a great workout. I think I ended up doing about half a dozen benches. Um, an interesting thing that I encountered while there and in, in standing in line and talking to a couple of young women that were behind me, um, they traveled all the way from the East Bay to participate in that event. They have no connection really to Santa Rosa other than uh, they happened to see the event. I neglected to ask how, but um, it was a beautiful day and they love trees and they decided let's drive up to Santa Rosa and participate in this event and have lunch. So. That was really fun to, to get to meet those folks. And uh, so um, in terms of new parks, I didn't attend a new park this month, but I did uh, attend a new park a couple of months ago, Dutch Floor, in conjunction with our agenda item. And uh, what a lovely, lovely neighborhood park. So I, I appreciate your suggestion that we get out and see more of these parks. It's, it's uh, really eye-opening. So thank you. Great. That was perfect, Terry. Good job. Uh, we will go to Carolina next. Do you have an update? Oh, we can't hear you, Carolina. We'd love to, though. Can I slip in the Merit Awards? The yes, Merit Awards that, is, that is, is kind of a, related. It's a kind of a, a sister of the of uh, Park and Rec. We are meeting. We're starting to meet on April the 4th. I will keep you, that will be part of my report outs. I'll do parks, but I'm gonna remind you all about the Merit Awards and look around your neighborhood. And this is last year, so don't pay attention to the, to the printing on it. Um, uh, pay attention to people in your neighborhood who are helping beautify the community. Um, it, because it's a wonderful award and don't worry, I won't let you miss it. I'll remind you on a uh, monthly basis about it. And I'm sorry I didn't, but I love the idea of going to visit parks. And um, I have a couple of ones that I'm just gonna go back and see because I love them so much. So thank you for it. That works too. If you just wanna talk about your favorite park, that, that's great. And as long as you're on the merit awards, you're free from all challenges. <laughs> so thank you for your work on that you bet. um we'll go yeah we'll go next to guido do you have an update guido make sure you're uh, unmuted there so we can hear you loud and clear i uh, no, i don't exactly but i'm uh, concerned about a couple of items at uh, the southwest community park on uh, hearn avenue which is close to me and uh I've had some people uh, there. That place is packed all the time. 
and I've had some uh, parents there that were a little bit concerned about more playground equipment for the, the little, little children. And that's the only thing that I wanted to bring up, but because there's plenty of things for the adults there, but they said they did, just didn't have enough for little little kids to be playing. Well, that's that's great, thank you for that update. That's a well-loved park indeed. Uh, Steve, do you have an update? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I visited all of the parks last fall that are in uh, District 3, uh, but it was on a weekend and I had an opportunity to just, you know, chat with people who weren't using the park. But uh, I've started going back after work hours during the week to see if I can find, uh, you know, different people who, you know, may not uh, have the opportunity to go during the week or go during the weekend. I also met with... Uh, our, our new council uh, member, McDonald, and we planted the seed of uh, chatting in the future about potential goals that she might have for Rex and Park and for, for her uh, district. And um, I'm also continuing to pursue two property owners who have voiced interest in donating land to the city for uh, open space. And I will talk to, I talked just briefly, uh, exchanged an email with Jen on that a couple of months ago. Uh, slow process, but who knows how it might turn out. We might be able to, you know, add something to the uh, inventory of parks and open space uh, at no cost. Wonderful. Thanks for the update, Steve. And Carol, we'd love to hear your update. So the new park I visited was the one in Rincon Valley for Arbor Day. Um, I grew up in Rincon Valley. Uh, that park was probably an open field when I went to Rincon Valley Junior High School. So it was mind blowing to see how much the neighborhood has grown up. Um, an unexpected shout out, I already told him this, but um, aside from the turnout, because there were over a hundred people there, um, I got to spend some time with Elio. Sorry, Elio, I'm gonna call you out. Um, I know Elio from our time together at the Rural Cemetery, so I was going to say my goodbyes and he was engaged with a woman who had a specific concern. And Elio was so incredibly professional, professional and personal and um, just a really good representative of the city of Santa Rosa and the Parks Department. I left the conversation with, wow, why is this woman saying this wasn't very well advertised when there were placards everywhere and it was in the guide, but she didn't know. And Elio just handled it with much more grace than I would have. So in, uh, I called him up the next Monday morning and a lot of people don't like getting phone calls from Carol Kwan on Monday morning. I think I surprised Elio when I just told him what a great job he did. So that was my new park. Um, today I drove by South Davis for the second time. What a challenging opportunity that, that parcel is. And I look forward to um, hearing from the community tomorrow night at the virtual setting. Um, other, I, I'm at Rinkin, I got to meet Diana McDonald and um, took some pictures of her and interacted and that was a lot of fun, her and her husband. And uh, other than that, I just spend an awful lot of time hanging out at the cemetery. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was great to see Councilmember McDonald out at the park. And uh, let's get all our council members to come to our cleanup days. So talk to your council member and, and uh, don't ever stop bugging them about that. Um, it was great to see. And yeah, the staff was great to see too. They all had smiling faces on a Saturday morning. So good work. Uh, to all the staff, it, the park, it, it's just really cool to go there. It's already a nice park. And then as you're leaving, it just looks even better. You can see all the work that's been done. So thanks everyone. And that was perfect. We did great on our updates. So um, no griping this month, uh, really. So thank you everyone for uh, entertaining our new uh, standing agenda item. Um, now we are gonna move on uh, to eight, uh, item 8.1. This is our vice chair nomination and election. Um, so let me explain the rules to folks um, and just kind of how this is going to go. So we will open the floor for nominations for formal motions 
Uh, but before we do that, let me just explain the rules and a little bit about our, our customs here. So anyone, here's the rules. Anyone can make a nomination and put a motion on a table. Uh, then someone uh, needs to second it. Um, if there's only one nomination, we can basically do this by acclamation and, and not need to do a, a tally vote. Uh, the person who's nominated needs to accept. Uh, if they decline, then we move on to another nomination. If we have more than two nominations, uh, if there were two nominations, we'd vote on the first and then on the second, and whoever got the most votes uh, would win. If we have three, it gets a little more pro uh, complicated with a process of elimination. Um, and we would basically uh, vote for two at once. And then uh, if no one receives any votes, they would not advance to the next round. Um, and so uh, before we go any, to any formal motions, uh, this is, you know, we want to make this a, feel like an open process. Uh, Let's let's get any volunteers. Does anyone does anyone desire to be vice chair? Let's start there. Um, a strong burning desire to help to step up and and be the vice chair of the board of community services. Do I have any volunteers? All right. Someone's going to get forced into this. So no one's volunteering. Um, now that was supposed to be the friendly discussion. So now, oh, Steve. Are we going to motions? We can do that. Let's go to motions. We didn't we didn't uh, have any volunteers. Um, so I will now accept motions from the board. Steve, were you about to do a motion? Uh, no, I was just really more inquiring of the job description. <laughs> Maybe Why don't we defer to Deputy Director Santos on that? And sorry, Steve, did you have a further question? I didn't mean no. to interrupt you. Jen, go ahead. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's it's very simple. I say that. Uh, it's really uh, following up if the chair is out to um, organize and run this meeting and uh, being out in the community on behalf of the chair or the board if the chair is not available, things like that. So it's... In, there's nothing hyper specific, but this meeting for sure would be um, something we would look to the vice chair to run and work with staff to um, to get going. That's the I think the biggest role, and the rest of it would be just following in the footsteps of the chair. Um, that's 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 probably the biggest. Um, you know, it, depending on how long the chair is out. Okay. That's thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, if no one will volunteer, I will. Okay. Do thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Do we have any other volunteers? Just ask one more time. Going once, going twice. Okay. Before you agree, Steve, let me just be give you a little bit of transparency. You might be running next month's meeting, and I say that only because I will be overseas and in Scotland, and it will be uh, midnight local time when the meeting begins. So I'm going to do my best to chair that meeting. But there may be, it's also the day after I attend a wedding. So circumstances may be out of my control and I may not be able to chair that meeting. I'm going to do my best, but I just want to let you know, you could be thrown right into the deep end first meeting. It is that okay? Midnight Pacific time? <laughs> a midnight Edinburgh time. Okay. Uh, I have chaired numerous commissions and committees before, so I'm fairly comfortable with this. and. And with staff and our regular board members, I'm sure that they will help if I stumble. Great. I appreciate the confidence um, uh, to be determined if you'll have to do that. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Don't worry. Okay. So since we have no other volunteers, I will simply ask for a vote of acclamation. And what I'll do is I'll just ask everyone to unmute their microphone uh, and just uh, Proceed. I think we'll we will do a formal motion, though. I'm sorry. Let's just do, let's just do that officially. Um, and I believe also that we do need to take public comment uh, before we do the vote. Do I have that correct, Jen? Yes. Yeah. We want to. Yeah. So and make the motion or make. Yeah. Okay. We'll do public comment and then we'll come back for a motion. Do we have any public comments on agenda item 8.1? Thank you. We have no hands raised at this time. 
Okay. I would like to entertain a motion for vice chair. I will make a motion to nominate uh, board member Stillman as vice chair. I'll second that. Okay. Great. We have a motion introduced by Terry and seconded by Carol. Thank you for that. Do you, aware what have you, no... for? <laughs> do you accept this, Steve? Yes, I do. Okay. No going back. All right. I will ask everyone to unmute their microphone. And uh, if you agree with this, please say aye. 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 Great. You have been elected by acclamation, Steve. Congratulations. Or condolences. Yeah, you'll do great. <laughs> Seriously, thank you for stepping up. Um, we appreciate your experience and dedication. All right, um, moving on. Uh, that was that was easy. Thank you for making that easy, everyone. Um, do we have any any discussion, any further discussion on that from anyone? Any comments? No. But I want to thank Terry for her service as vice chair. Um, you've done a great job, Terry. So thank you, and I know you will have the same level of commitment to the board because that's the type of public servant you are. So thank you. All right. So we will now move on to uh, eight point two. Um, Kim and Elio, are you ready to uh, present our volunteer program, park monitors and park permits? Yes, we're ready. There we go. There we go. Hey, Elio's got his uniform on looking sharp. Okay, kick it off. <laughs> so um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but what an opening, what a lovely opening remark you guys all gave us. Um, I can't think of a better lead in to our presentation today. Um, and I appreciate all your support in being in our programs. Um, so thank you. Uh, so I th thank you for the opportunity to present our park permit program, our park monitor program, and our volunteer program. Our focus today is going to be on um, how recreation and the park department work together to provide these services to our community. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim Hatch, and I'm the recreation coordinator, coordinator that oversees these programs. Um, the success of these programs are definitely a partnership by recreation and park. And, uh, in the past, it's only been recreation that has presented these programs to you. So I'm really thrilled today that Elio and I have teamed up to present to you um, what we've accomplished this year. And I think that park maintenance needs to be recognized for what they do and what services they provide to our community. So Elio, a little later, will introduce himself. Um, and because we're doing this together, I'm going to just lay out the presentation so you guys can get a little oriented before we flip back and forth. So um, we're going to talk about the park permits and the park monitors first, and then we're going to talk about the volunteer program. And each section will hit four topics. I will talk about um, the service and why it's of value to our community. And then I will discuss how we work together to provide these services. I'll pass it over to Elio. Elio will talk about the challenges of 2021. And, you know, of course, 2021, there were challenges. Um, but he'll, despite those challenges, he'll, he'll talk about what we were able to accomplish. Then he's going to talk about the future of these programs, where we want to see them grow, how we'd like to see them expand. So with that, and, and I should say, if we can entertain you a little bit during this presentation, that will be an extra added bonus. So with that, I want to start off our presentation, Rec and Park, the yin to your yang. Next slide, please. So the number one question I get asked in park permits, and we're starting off with park permits, is why do I need a park permit? And it's a great question. It's a question I like to, I do like to answer. Um, and my answer is almost always around the lines of, have you ever had a neighbor who was awful? A neighbor who threw trash all over their yard, a neighbor who had parties all day and all night, who blasted their music? A neighbor who drove their car up and over your sidewalk, almost hitting your kids and parked their car right in the middle of their lawn. Well, all of our parks are located in neighborhoods. Even our community park has neighbors, residents that live by. And we wanna be good neighbors. 
Not all activities in a park require a park permit, but if the activity has a potential of damaging the park or the potential to disrupt the enjoyment of the park by um, other park visitors or the potential to impact the surrounding neighbor, then we do need and require a park permit. And a lot of people, when they hear the word permit, and I'm sure you guys felt the same way when you're like, oh, great, I get a, a presentation on permits. You think of the paperwork and the red tape, and it's not a fun topic. Um, but for us in recreation and parks, it's not about the paperwork. It is totally about the people and the service we provide to them. And I do have an example of this. On your screens, you can see two uh, pictures of trash. And um, this is trash that was cleaned up from the Southwest Community Park after an unpermitted basketball tournament. It took two park staff two and a half hours to clean up that trash. Um, and it also was impacting the neighbors. The neighbors were calling the police and the police had to come out repeatedly and the, repeat, the police came out and they broke up the event. And then the event would just come back later that day, later that week, it happened repeatedly over and over again. So I don't know if you guys can see me, but park permits to the rescue. I'm doing my superwoman pose right now because park permits does what the police cannot do. And we headed out to that park. We sent our park monitor out there to make contact with that event um, organizer. And our approach is not to say necessarily no, because clearly this was an event that the community wanted. They had over 100 people participating in this basketball tournament. The community was embracing it, but the issue was um, that it was impacting our park and was impacting the surrounding neighbors. So we sent um, our park host out there. He went out there and he talked to them and he said, let us help you. We want you to be able to offer this service to the community, but let us help you through the park permit process. Come to us. We'll get you all set up. We won't have you impacting the neighborhood. We won't have you impacting the park. Um, and then you, the police don't have to come out. And he left, right? And we just hope, we have to hope. And I have to say that he does this all the time and more people do reach out to us than they don't. I do believe that people do wanna follow the rules. They just need to know the rules and they don't really understand necessarily from another person's perspective. So that event um, host reached out to us and um, I think he reached out within two weeks. We worked on that with that group um, to get their park permit. We also had to, uh, give them information on how to get their sound permit with the police department and a fire permit for their propane tank use. Um, we worked with them to come up with a trash management plan and a restroom plan. Their event is growing and so, um, and they're holding another one soon. And so we are now requiring a parking plan because we don't want to impact, um, there is a parking lot there, but it's not big enough. Um, there is a lot of activity in that park and we don't want to impact the surrounding neighbors. So uh, I'm really happy to say that uh, in 2021, that event organizer held eight basketball tournaments and we did not receive any complaints after they went through the, permit, the park permit process. So that's really the success of park permits. That's really our purpose. Um, we want to help people out to hold these events that benefit the community but we wanna do it in a way that um, is beneficial to all involved. So um, with that, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So meet our park permit team, and it is a team, it's recreation and park. We have uh, all the recreation staff in blue and then all the park staff um, in green. We are a team that works together to accomplish the park permits. Um, this is clearly not everybody. And if you see a little plus sign with a number next to a face, that's because they represent that many more staff that do that position. I could not include everybody on this slide. So, um, so then there is also people that are circled in black and those are our permanent full-time staff. The people circled in orange are our part-time, um, either part-time um, permanent staff, but more likely there are part-time temp staff. I just wanted to point that out because we do rely a lot on our temp staff. Um, they are critical to our operation. And I, if I do say myself, I started as a temp staff and we are fantastic. And, and hopefully they move up and they're promoted. But um, it is the nature of a temp position to be temporary. 
So they are only allowed to work part-time. They can't work over a thousand hours um, a year. So that means under 20 hours a week, typically, and they don't receive benefits. So there is a high turnover rate in the temp staff. Um, and that is a, a, a strain on the permanent staff because it is um, us having to hire and replace and train um, repeatedly. An example of this is our activity specialist that I have um, on our slide here. In the three years that I've done park permits, I've had three different activity specialists. And it's not because I'm a bad boss. <laughs> At least I don't, I hope it's not because of that. Um, one person could not afford here to live here on the temp pay and they had to move to Arizona. And then our other staff member was promoted to another um, city department as a permanent staff. So um, that, and that's just the nature. We want people to move on and, and um, become permanent staff whenever they can, but it is a strain and it is a burden on the permanent staff to constantly be training and rehiring and replacing. So real quick, I'm just gonna run through really briefly like how, how all of these jobs touch on a park permit because they all do. We have our front desk staff at Finley and they are our first point of contact. They determine if it's a picnic reservation or a park permit. If it's a picnic reservation, they can take care of it and it, it skips through all of the other people. If it is a park permit though, it does require more, um, more work. And so then it goes to our activity specialist. Our activity specialist is the person who does all the correspondence and uh, manages our park permit email and our park permit um, phone. She also books all of the permits into our system and manages the timelines to make sure that we're meeting deadline, de the deadlines for each um, permit. Then there's the recreation coordinator, me, that cheerful person right there. And um, my job is to coordinate between um, the recreation and the parks department. I oversee the activity specialist and the park host. Um, I have to approve all applications. I have to issue out the requirements for those permits to happen. And um, I also attend all the pre-event meetings for um, any large events. Then we have our recreation supervisor, Amy, who you guys met last month. Um, she also oversees the sports permits. So her job is to kind of coordinate these permits internally to make sure that we're not overlapping on each other. It's very easy to like um, have too many permits going into one park at one time. So she kind of coordinates coordinates that, make sure we're not doing that. She also has to sign every single permit, every single sports permit, every single park permit, um, every picnic reservation, they all have to be signed by a supervisor. So then down below, um, you guys can see Elio's face. And like I said, he'll introduce himself in a second. He is one of two park crew, crew supervisors. He is my contact that I coordinate any um, anything that has to do with park permits. Uh, he also supervises all the park maintenance staff and make sure that if we have any um, special things that need to done for, be done for a permit, he makes sure that they happen. Uh, next to him, we have the park maintenance staff. They are the staff that are in our park every day. They're making sure it's clean, safe, and usable. We also have our weekend staff. This staff is actually kind of like both and fluid. A lot of our park maintenance staff does work a Saturday or a Sunday, but the weekend staff that I'm focusing on is our, our temp weekend staff and they're required um, or their focus is on the weekends to go to the picnic sites and make sure that they're cleaned up and usable, that the trash is removed and the bathrooms are open and operational. And then lastly, we have the park host. Um, our park host focuses on the people. He's out there meeting the people in the park. He's, he, he goes out to the event organizer. Is everything okay? Did you have any issues? Is something, is the bathroom not working? How can I help you with someone in your spot? He also um, makes sure that they are doing what they said they were doing. Like if they are not having a jumpy and he goes out there and he sees that they're having a jumpy. Um, and he's also our face. Like if, if, if someone doesn't clean up uh, after seeing Dennis's face, then, uh, you know, then I'm shocked because Dennis is so pleasant and nice and wonderful that nobody wants to leave a mess for him. So he is our face to the public. Um, and then another part of his job is he goes around to the events that are 
unpermitted because I would say most of the events and activities in our park are not permitted. Um, he goes around and he gives them information on how to get a park permit. So that is the staff, as you can see, it's a lot of staff that is required to provide this service and that um, just like the title says, working together is our success. So with that, I would like to pass it on to my um, teammate, Elio. Elio, take it away and next slide, please. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, Chair Pitts and board members. Uh, my name is Elio Toronto and I am one of the Parks crew supervisors alongside Tim Finnegan, who um, presented to you guys uh, last month. Um, I definitely could not do this job without Tim. Uh, he's been a great uh, role model for me in this position. Uh, I have been with Parks only 10 months, so I'm trying to absorb as much information uh, as possible. Uh, there's a lot to learn uh, with Park uh, and Rec and being separate and, and hopefully one day being together, who knows. Um, but I came over from facilities maintenance. Um, so I have worked with the city for about five years. Um, so I'm really excited to be in parks. Um, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present today um, and also thank Kim, uh, my teammate for working with me. Um, Kim has been instrumental in guiding me through the volunteer program. So I'm very grateful um, to Kim for that. Um, also grateful uh, for the support that the board gives us. So with that, I'm um, gonna talk about first um, the demand uh, that was up in 2021 uh, for park permits and some of the services that were kept the same. Um, if not, uh, they dropped a little bit. So with that being said, demand was up in 2021 in our parks. We had uh, more people out and about, uh, more large gatherings as people were eager to get out into um, some of our public shared spaces. Social services and local businesses also drove up the demand for park permits as well. And if you look on the slide here, you'll see that um, the demand was up, obviously, because of larger social gatherings and the social services uh, like COVID relief stuff, as well as some of the local businesses that couldn't operate um, within um, the confines of their buildings that needed to take it outside. And one of the biggest things to note um, under the park permits area is that in 2019, which is a pre-COVID year, uh, we served 114,129 people. And if you look directly above that, you'll see that there was only about 708, uh, excuse me, only 31,653 people served in 2021. So um, pre-COVID, obviously numbers were still not there. 2020 was um, basically shut down, uh, but 2021, we're trying to make a comeback. Uh, so the demand was there. Um, and we're hoping that it continues to rise. On the flip side to that, uh, what I'd like to talk about is some of the budget cuts. And with that, there was a proposed cut of three vacant groundskeeper positions that we had that were not filled. Um, and that affected the maintenance um, that we provided in our parks. And that was specific to the reopening of bathrooms. Um, so basically what happened in 2020, our bathrooms were shut down. Um, in 2021, uh, we, did not have three uh, groundskeeper positions who are integral in, in providing a clean and safe environment for our bathrooms. Um, so we did not have those three groundskeeper positions. We also did not have picnic site reservations during the week. So they were only on the weekend um, because we didn't have the staff to um, basically be in the parks every day due to um, rising demand in other parts of our parks and landscape areas. We also did close a parking lot um, at Doyle and that affected the park permits as well. Uh, people could still access Doyle Park. There is still a, a large open parking lot, but that did affect it as well. We weren't able to have that open all the time. And then of course the bathrooms. Um, with that being said, uh, fortunately bathrooms eventually were reopened uh, to full capacity in late 2021. And that was with uh, or in conjunction with the hiring of those three groundskeepers that were slated to be cut. So we did eventually get those three groundskeepers back. Um, and I wanna thank the board for providing support in the hiring of these three positions. And that really helped us um, get back to opening and, and keeping our bathrooms safe. Um, I will say that in park maintenance, we currently have 20 full-time employees and five temp staff. Um, and those temp staffs are only allowed to work a thousand hours uh, per fiscal year max. I also would like to note that um, 
I really owe a, a great gratitude to our maintenance staff. Um, myself and Tim are the supervisors, but the, the maintenance staff are, are in the parks every day, um, seven days a week, and uh, they try to keep the parks in as best shape as possible for the public to use. So we're very grateful to them. Next slide, please. Okay, so park permits played a huge role in the COVID recovery. Um, as people were eager to gather in a safe place outside being cooped up for such a long time, um, although COVID was still around, they were able to gather in parks and parks um, provided that space for them to gather. There were testing facilities um, in parks and vaccination clinics and also food distribution um, uh, areas that were held in various parks throughout the city uh, that provided aid to those in need. So parks uh, played a huge role in that. Essentially having the ability to, to, to provide an outdoor space to local businesses to help them through difficult times during COVID is, is just another reason why the park permit uh, program is such a valuable resource for anybody in need. It's exciting to note that larger events are coming back. A few did in 2021, um, such as marathons and then uh, the Harvest Festival at their park. Some other larger events like the uh, Father's Day car show will return in 2022 at Juilliard Park. Um, on the slide, you'll see a good example of a large uh, event that was held at Howarth in the top right picture there. And that just shows the capacity that our parks have um, to hold these larger events. We just need the staff and the resources to, to support that event as well. Also, picnic reservations are now back all week, uh, which started on March 5th. So it's no longer just weekends. Um, and as you can see in the top left corner there, a picture of a park monitor um, who's posting a reservation sign at one of the picnic sites. We're also um, offering winter covered picnic sites, uh, which are at Howard, Finley, Bear Park, uh, Southwest. In that bottom left corner there, that's a picture of Finley, which is a very popular site. It's incredibly busy on the weekends. Um, there's barbecues there. So it's just these covered areas are a huge resource uh, for, for park permits. And a lot of people love to gather in these areas. And especially during the winter to offer those is, is wonderful. Um, a big thing that uh, park maintenance really appreciates is recreation has helped with the park monitor being available to open bathrooms for events. Uh, they post reservation signs and check for maintenance issues. So with staffing levels being um, somewhat tight on the maintenance side for, for daily duties, uh, the park monitor system has really helped us out a lot um, in, in being able to be in the parks on weekends. Um, and speaking of weekends, that's where the park monitor really helps us the most. Uh, park maintenance has five um, workers on Monday, excuse me, Saturday, and five workers on Sunday. Um, and they're specifically there to open bathrooms, clean the bathrooms, make sure that the bathrooms are safe, and then pick up trash around the parks. And you can imagine Howard Park in spring or summer and how many people will be there um, in the park. So the maintenance really needs to focus on keeping the bathrooms going and whatnot. So that park monitor on the weekend has really been uh, beneficial to park maintenance and we really appreciate it. Um, I'll pass it back to Kim now for the next few slides. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so transitioning um, out of park permits into our volunteer program. With park permits, like I said, most people think of the paperwork and forget about the people. Um, with the volunteer program, most people think about the people and forget about the paperwork or the management that's required to operate that program. And of course, why wouldn't we think about the volunteers? They are fantastic. Um, our volunteers in our city are amazing and their creativity and their passion cannot be matched. Um, and uh, all the pictures you see on our slide right here are all um, programs that were created or maintained by volunteers. And um, I just want you to imagine for a second Howarth Park without the Western town that was built by volunteers, or the rural cemetery without lamplight or the dark side tour. Um, youth Park, not a lot of people know this about Youth Park, but there's a Frisbee golf course in the back of Youth Park. Um, youth, that's all volunteer created and um, maintained. We also at Youth Park have a train out there, 
um, that's operated in the summer and that's all run by volunteers as well. There's the pump track at Northwest and the RC track at a place to play. These are just some of the areas that make our city like iconic and special and unique and they're all volunteer created. Um, we have a new one that's coming and it's, if you see the two kids on the screen that look like they just won a brand new car, um, they didn't win a brand new car, but they're super excited because they're on a story walk. Um, so we have, uh, in the Adopt a Green Space program, we have the Rincon Valley um, Library uh, doing an Adopt a Green Space at Rincon Valley Park, where they are um, putting up these temporary signs. And basically what they do is they dissect a children's book and they blow up the pages and they put each page as one sign and they put it along the path and the kids walk, they get a read. Then there's some kind of physical aspect where that says like, you know, quack like a duck. So then they have to quack like a duck to the next um, sign. And then it also engages them to look around and see what's going on around their, um, in their park. So it's like, do you see any other birds in your park? It's a fantastic thing. I'm super excited. It just went up two days ago. Check it out. Um, it's there now. Um, and so we're already talking like this is only a temporary thing. It's not a permanent uh, thing that it'll be there like for a month, but I'm already talking with them. We're thinking like it would be fantastic if we did a book about bikes at the Northwest Park by the pump track or a book about trains at Youth Park by the train track. So we're already thinking of new um, ways to um, spread this enjoyment to the community. So this program, like I said, is, is brought by the Adopt a Green Space program, um, but typically it does have some recreation programming, but it typically is the maintenance of a park. So anyone can adopt a park or an area of a park or even a median to take care of. And so we do have a lot of, of people who do that. And this year we had, um, a brand new group that at DeMeo Park that has adopted DeMeo Park and they're really doing a good job getting it cleaned up and working out there. So um, I'm only focusing on one small aspect of our volunteer program. Our volunteer program is, is very large, um, but I, I can't spend all day or all night talking to you guys. So I'm just shorting it down to that adopt a green space program. And I would say behind every successful volunteer is a very, tired, hardworking city staff. And with that, I'd like to move on to the next slide, please. So when our volunteer program started, um, we were all, uh, all the components needed for our volunteer program were under one department, the Rec and Park Department. In recent years, we've been split into three different divisions. Um, so our components have been split into three div different divisions. We have the communication division that is in charge of our recruitment and marketing and advertising for our volunteer events. But she also does our website maintenance. Then we have me in the middle um, with recreation. I do the screening and placing of volunteers. I orient, um, do the orientation and the onboarding. I do all the forms, all the procedures, all the guidelines. I do, the, I, I do the planning for the appreciation events, um, such as the Merit Award, which not, doesn't just cover the Rec and Park volunteers, it covers volunteers throughout the whole city. Um, I maintain the uh, volunteer budget and um, do the, uh, maintain the database of volunteers in Volunteer Hub. Then we have Elio on the park division side. He does the training of the park staff, our volunteer staff. He organizes the workday events and not just the park a month workday events. Um, those are only a few of the workday that he has to organize. There's a lot of workdays that are um, community organized, like we have Bennett Valley Vision. So he has to work with them on their workday. We also have um, the dog parks. They have groups out there that have a workday and he supplies them and sets them up. Um, the DeMeo group, he helps them out. There's, uh, that's just a few of them. He schedules those work days um, with the volunteers. He provides supervision. And by he, like it's him and his staff that is providing it. Um, and then he also evaluates the work that the volunteers are doing. So, so this works great, um, but unfortunately because we're three divisions, uh, it does require that we all three have the same volunteer mission 
And any of our divisions, if they're given another priority that is not volunteers, that volunteer program stops. Um, it can't move forward because we require all three of these divisions to be to be a part of and to have a component to our volunteer program. And this has happened um, with all three of the divisions at one time over the past few years where we couldn't move forward with the volunteer program because um, our priority was placed elsewhere. So we, we do know how to run a successful volunteer program, um, but, but we just all need to be focused on the same mission. And that was really evident by our Arbor Day event, which you guys, so many of you showed up for. That was all three of our divisions focused together to provide that service. And it was fantastic. Um, like you guys said, we had over a hundred volunteers. We planted, I think it was 23, maybe it was 26, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we planted trees, we painted the picnic tables, the sports fields, soccer and baseball, they got addressed. Um, we celebrated Luther Burbank's birthday. We had cupcakes and slushies. We gave away um, trees. We had vendors out there. We had a DJ. As one volunteer said, it was a joyous, joyous day. And I could not agree more. Um, I really feel lucky to be a part of this and get paid to do it. It's a it's a really it's a great great feeling to be out there, and it gives me encouragement for how wonderful our community is, um, and it it really makes me happy. So that Arbor Day that really highlighted um, what we can do when the three departments are united on one mission. It highlighted all of our skill our, our skills and our talents, and um, I just. Uh, uh, I think it was just a fantastic event. With that, I would like to turn it over to Elio. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kim. Uh, just, just reiterating what Kim um, has said, uh, how much we do appreciate our volunteers and especially in park maintenance with um, the shortages that we do have uh, with resources. Uh, they provide uh, so, much, so much help and it, it really benefits our department as a whole. And we're very fortunate to have the groups that are working out in the field um, behind the scenes that don't get all, a lot of the recognition um, that they do deserve. But we have so many groups out there that, that are in our parks daily and they really, really, really help us a lot. So we're grateful to them. Unfortunately, volunteers are not free. Uh, like all staff, they do require some degree of management and planning which does translate to labor and time for both recreation and park staff. However, volunteers are a very valuable resource, but they are not exactly the solution to staffing problems in maintenance. We need to recruit, we need to retain the volunteers, we need to plan, schedule, and train the volunteers, which does take time. And of course, the biggest one is that we need to show our appreciation and our gratitude to all these volunteers who are giving up their time to give back to the community. Despite some of these challenges that we do face, um, volunteers along with staff uh, were able to accomplish 33 workdays, 18 proposals, and 20 adopt space agreements, which is incredible, which all equates to 2,956 hours, um, which is incredible if you think about 33 workdays throughout the year and the amount of people that are at these smaller events that, that not all of us know about, it's just incredible. Um, to me, the amount of work that they're able to get done on a Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. So it's really great. Once a volunteer or, or a group establishes a proposal with Kim, our maintenance team will begin to organize the meetings and training and work days that will take place moving forward. So we must go over safety regulations and give any advanced training on any specified equipment that will be used while volunteering, namely power equipment. We try to have our volunteers do as much as possible we just have to make sure that they're safe uh, when they're working in our parks. And if there's an adoptive space agreement um, with an individual who wants to use power equipment, we do have to go over training. Um, and Tim and myself um, are in the field a lot and, and it takes some time to meet with these individuals and, and go over some of the safety aspects of, of running that equipment. And the biggest thing is, is we also need to highlight our volunteer groups by having these appreciation barbecues or events to give thanks and show our appreciation for the time that they do spend in our parks and giving back to their community. Uh, we value the volunteers and definitely could not maintain some of our designated areas 
without the support and hard work that they put in. Because we do have a lot of areas to cover in maintenance. So we really, really appreciate that. Next slide, please. So on to the future. We're very, very excited. Let's get cooking. Um, Park a month is back. Like Kim has noted a few times, um, Arbor Day was a great, great uh, day and it was something that I was very proud to be a part of. I'd never been a part of something uh, like that and I was astonished to see how many people were out there. We also had a volunteer Park a Month Day at Franklin Park, which was in the previous month, which was very exciting. So Park a Month uh, coming back is great for recreation, great for parks. Um, and we're very excited to see where it can go this year. Uh, one thing that we have discussed and we'd like to move forward on is a volunteer trailer. And essentially what that does for our maintenance staff who has daily responsibilities is if we had a volunteer trailer, um, they would be able to have all of the resources that they need in one trailer. And that includes supplies, personal protective equipment and materials that we would essentially hook up to on a Saturday morning drive out to the park and we would park that trailer and we, we'd be able to have everything in one spot. Currently on Thursday or Friday leading up to a park a month day, um, our maintenance staff is pulled out of their parks and we have a shed out back on our levee that we go and we start pulling different tools out and we loading up, load them up in multiple different trailers. So it does take some time. So we hope that eventually um, it, become, it can become more fluid with that volunteer trailer. We could also put signage on that trailer uh, to promote you know, where we got the money from. Um, Parks Make Life Better could be on the side of it. It could be, um, could be a great advertisement for, for Parks and Rec and, and the programs that we provide. Also, the Merit Awards are kicked off, um, are going to kick off on April 10th, which Kim talked about a little bit. And then uh, we're also looking for some new ideas. Uh, myself and Tim Finnegan, the other supervisor, and our superintendent, James Castro, are working on a weekly basis to try to come up with new and fun ideas um, and, and different ideas that will help maintenance and help recreation with this volunteer program. Uh, one thing that we did come up with um, with Kim is this adopt the sports field program. We have so many different uh, sports teams out there in our parks that are willing to help us. So we're hoping that by putting this out there, they might be able to adopt a specific soccer field um, and they can help us maintain that soccer field. It would be really beneficial to maintenance and it would take a heavy load off of our shoulders. A few of the pictures on this slide you'll see in the bottom left is uh, the Franklin Park Park a Month. Um, you have some appreciation um, awards there in the middle and then an example of a potential trailer on the bottom right hand corner. And then those are some Arbor Day event pictures um, on the right side top and then the right side middle. Next slide please. So I just wanted to say thank you very much um, on behalf of Kim and myself. Uh, we appreciate the time um, that you guys took today to listen to our presentation. On the screen here, you have some contact information uh, via email to contact um, the different resources and recreation, as well as the parks maintenance email on the bottom there, which um, we have put out there to the public that they can reach us for any concerns in our parks that will essentially come into our system and we'll be able to create a work order for that um, to get it addressed. Uh, so thank you very much again. Um, we appreciate your time. Any questions? Thank you, Elio and Kim. Um, so right now from the board, just a reminder, we're gonna go to public comment and then we'll do our, com our personal comments and opinions. But before we get to that, are there any clarifying questions from the board? Any technical questions? I had a few. Um, oh, go ahead, Terry. Thanks, just a couple real quick. When um, somebody applies for a, um, a picnic permit or a park permit and there are multiple permits needed, are, is that um, something they get as a packet and they have one point of contact or is it um, split up among the departments and they, they have to work directly with fire and police and parks? So um, a little bit of both. With the police department, we've worked out a routine um, where we're the middleman, so they don't have to reach out directly to the police department. They give us their police um, permit ap um, amplified sound, and then we send it off to the police department and then send them the certificate. With the fire department, we have all of their information, so we can give them 
when they come in, we can give them their application that they need and all the information, and then they do go and take care of it with the fire department. And are there costs associated with each of those permits or is it one cost for the whole package? Um, so uh, the amp amplified sound is not a cost, but the fire permit is an additional cost. And then just to get some clarity about the um, park monitors versus the park host, are the park monitors temporary staff? It sounds like there's multiple people that function in that role versus the one park host. Do I have that right? Yeah, so right now we only really have a park host, um, uh, but we will be getting some more park monitors. The park monitor role um, uh, is a lesser role. The park host really, if there's any conflicts that are going on in the park, that is going to be the park host is going to have to resolve it. So they're at the bigger events. Um, and if there's any issue that a park monitor can't um, handle, then the park host will go out. The park monitor has more of um, an overview of looking around the park and talking to people and letting them know when they need a park permit, but they do not deal with any challenges. Great. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Any other questions from the board? Carol, go ahead. Thank you. Um, what are the what percentage of the events that should be permitted at our parks actually are permitted? What are the ramifications of the unpermitted activities? Do, do they get shut down? Is it? Um, and several years ago, we talked about the inherent danger of bouncy houses, specifically at Finley. And um, at that point, I think it was decided that the owner of the bouncy house companies having a permit in hand before they were allowed to, Jen, do you remember this? Did that, did that go into um, existence or is that still a work in progress? Well, I'll defer back to our volunteer staff because they've really taken on the lead with this and with the pandemic, there's been uh, lots of stops and starts. So I'll defer back to them and, and chime in about the historical if I need to. Um, actually, this, those are really good questions. Um, when I train our park monitor and park host staff, um, I train them that they are the bartenders of the park, not the bouncers. The bouncers are our police department. They are the ones that have to enforce the rules. We um, only educate the public on what the rules are. So we don't have the authority to um, tell someone to take down their jump house. We can inform them th that they do need a park permit. Um, and so we approach it with the information side. We're really trying to educate the public. It is a new policy. And so a lot of the public doesn't know about it. And um, before any enforcement sh can happen, they need to be educated. So we're really educating right now. Um, I would say percentage wise, uh, I don't know, at least 50% are not, not uh, going through the park permit process. But every time Dennis goes out there, every time he talks to someone, we get more people. And, we're, and that is also partly why our demand is going up because people are hearing about what they're supposed to do and they do wanna do the right thing. Um, so they are coming to us. I think I, did I answer all your questions? Thank you, Kim. Great, any other questions from board members? Okay, uh, I had a few questions. Um, thank you for that presentation. My first question, can adults use the bounce house? That's sarcasm, but uh, maybe someday. Um, so on the permitting, Kim, um, is there any sort of online portal? It seems like people have to go to Finley or did I hear that incorrectly? Um, we, so we do a lot of permits, um, not necessarily online, but there is an application on our website and they can submit it via email to us. So they don't have to come in. Um, we, we can do it all virtually. Okay. Is that also, um, 
is that form in Spanish or do you have staff who are bilingual that can help folks? So yeah, that is always a big challenge. We really do um, need to have bilingual uh, staff in our, at our front desk. And that is a skill that we're always recruiting for. Um, we do have it in both Spanish and English um, because uh, it's needed in both languages. Yeah, that's, I had imagined translating technical stuff would, would require a good amount of um, experience. So that, that might even be harder to find those folks. Um, thank you for, for making that a focus. Uh, and then um, also, this is a question, can we be invited to the appreciation days when those happen? So uh, I guess that's more of a comment. Please invite us. Um, we'd love to know about that too. Um, and then on the volunteer outreach, can you explain how that happens? Is it just like a sign posted or do you interface with like the team coach or how does that work that people know they can volunteer? And maybe, and I'm thinking more in those formal like adopt the sports field ways or even just like the average person, how do they actually find out about that? So a lot of it is through our website. Um, we do post signs in our park uh, ahead of time for the park a month event to give people a little bit of heads up. Marketing also does like um, some announcements. We uh, also go through uh, Sonoma County Volunteer Center. Um, so they know about us and they refer people to us as well. Um, we also, and Elio, I know he did this for this last park a month event with Arbor Day. He reached out to some of the sports groups that he's worked with. Um, and ask them to come and participate with our, um, our event. And I think we, that's something we definitely want to expand on. Like I'd like to reach out to all the surrounding schools near of the park that we're gonna be out and let them know about it. So that is something that we want to work on getting better at. Great. Um, Elio, do you have anything to add on that? I actually would like to add that. I know that, um, the internet these days is, is a, a fantastic way to, to notify people, but I will say that uh, within the community, the close community and proximity to the parks that we are working in on those days, a lot of the people sometimes don't find out. And this time around, uh, our superintendent, James Castro, did actually bring out some signs, some A-frame signs, A-frame signs, the week before the event um, with the date specified on it. So. Um, there was a little more outreach specific to the neighborhoods around the parks. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, when I was doing Rincon Valley, I had a little league player helping us with the baseball diamond. So that was great that he came out, him and his dad. Um, great. Okay, so we are now going to go to public comments. Um, and then after that, any board comments. Do we have any public commenters post? No, we do not have any hands raised at this time. Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, any comments or opinions folks want to want to offer for that presentation from the board. Terry, go ahead, please. Thank you. First, I want to just tell you that visually this presentation is gorgeous. Um, I really appreciated the format and the way you constructed the presentation. So kudos on that. It's, it's really, really nicely done. Um, I was curious, and I apologize, I didn't ask this question earlier. There were several uh, folks from Target stores at the Arbor Day event. And I was curious whether the city had a, an established relationship with local businesses to provide volunteers for certain events or whether they just came of their, of their own volition. Um, I actually spoke with one of the individuals from Target and I, I happened to know them. Um, from, from high school in the past. And I did ask them because there was a fairly large group and they just notified me that they uh, searched online for an event on that weekend. They had multiple employees at different events over that weekend. And that group just happened to find Rick and Valley and showed up. Great, so um, maybe the marketing team could do some additional outreach with local businesses in, in that same manner encourage them to send employees to our to our park events. So I really appreciate all the work um, on the volunteer program. And um, I look forward to seeing it continue and, and grow. Um, one other quick question with regard to the trailer, is that 
potentially going to be an ask in this year's budget or will you be seeking um, other sources of funding for that? Um, I, may, I may not be able to answer that perfectly. Maybe I can defer to Jen or my superintendent, yeah. Ms. Castro, on that question. I, I can help you. We are looking at funding that through our Measure M program. So it will be part of the budgetary process going forward to council, but it's a really exciting way to, and a great way to spend our money to get that trailer wrapped with volunteer information on it. It's gonna be really cool uh, and long time coming and a great idea from the, from, the, from the team. Great, thank you so much. That's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Terry. Carol. Uh, I have several. I'm going to go back. The um, the book thing. The um, you guys probably aren't old enough to remember Burmashave. Burmashave. When you were driving across the country, there was one page like every 20 seconds. So this is like a park version of Burmashave. Number one, I don't know who's coming up with the money for it. If it's a, a library thing or if it's a park thing, but this is really cool. When one book is done at one park, why doesn't that book move to a different park and you could have five books that made their way through all the parks and all the kids in all the parks could see them rather than having just a one go. Um, this, is, this, is, this, this clicks so many boxes all at the same time. It's very exciting. Um, so I can answer that. So the library is funding it all. Um, and they are doing it through their funding that they also received. I don't know what measure it was, um, but they actually have to share these signs with other libraries. So they only have one set of signs. Um, so that's why we can only do one at a time. Uh, the, the next thing I was wondering was um, what kind of ideas you guys have kicked around to make the transition of staff, the activity specialist specifically, knowing, I assume it's budgetary strength more than anything else that prevents the staff from either having a full-time position or staying long-term. Knowing that ahead of time, um, has staff wrapped its head around like um, training manuals? How, how, do you, how do you cope with something that you know is going to be uh, repeating detriment over and over. You guys have so many repeating detriments that we don't seem to be, as a city, able to fund your way out of. So, so what do you do? Um, uh, I was gonna say LEO and I can both answer that. LEO, I'll let you go. <laughs> um, so being, being newer to, to parks in this position, I think, um, our current goal is to hire um, more temp staff. And I understand that there is, you know, sometimes a lot of turnover with temp staff, um, but hopefully we can develop some kind of program where when we do bring in temp staff, we know exactly what, um, what their duties are gonna be and maybe some kind of manual or some kind of temporary staff manual that we can provide to incoming employees um, that would benefit them instead of just coming in and not really sure what they're doing, but if we could establish their schedule, establish their duties, um, and if they happen to move on to a different position or different job, the next person in at least has an idea of what they're coming in with. Uh, the next question I had was, when things like the train or the RC park happen, that specific groups who are looking for something that really serves their special need, and that is really cool. I'm wondering how we get neighborhoods to say, we love our park and we wanna be a special interest group known as the neighborhood. How do we encourage neighborhoods to adopt their parks? Is, is that something that, um, that staff has kicked around? And I'll piggyback, my last question is, what can we as a board do to help you? So um, I was actually hoping someone would ask what you guys can do to help because um, that's a great question. I, I think there's three levels of how you guys can help us. Um, and, and 
the one level is, you know, just be sure to tell our story, tell our story to city council, tell them the value of our program that we're part of the, the we're part of the recovery, COVID recovery. Um, let them know that we are struggling to offer these services, um, but they're really valuable to our community. So just uh, the more you can share our story, that that is really great. Um, I also have to say it is super motivating for me personally to see you guys at our volunteer event. So that is very helpful for me in like my spirit. So um, please continue to join us at those events. Um, and then maybe if, if working in a park is not your thing, um, I get it, but we also have like you can volunteer for our craft fair or our fairy tale ball, you know, come out. There's nothing more satisfying than to see these families at our fairy tale ball having a blast. Um, a, a child's first step into community is their family and friends. And so these programs that we offer through recreation are, are their first step into the community. Um, and they're really wonderful to see. So please join us at any of those. Um, and then um, a last, the last thing that um, would be helpful for us is we're having to make some hard decisions on what we can do and what we can't do. And if you guys can put input into where our priority is, um, because like we, we talked about, we are multiple departments and um, we need to have a, a focus, uh, a mission um, and have that narrowly de defined. Um, and so those are like the three levels that would be really helpful. But of course, um, recruiting, talking to people, telling them about our volunteer program. If you have anyone who complains to you, um, direct them to the volunteer program and let them get involved. We would love to work with them. Thank you, Kim. Any other questions from the board? All right, I, I had a few. At first, just Kim, I'd say that's a really great point. Your last point, you should always try to direct people's energy in a positive direction. Um, and so I think I will uh, take that to heart myself. Um, and that was that was great. Thank you for that. Uh, so let me, I'll ask a, a kind of a big question first, maybe to Jen. So in a hypothetical world where you have an unlimited budget, which I know is a fantasy, but is that volunteer so all those ingredients to get the volunteer program, is that enough for a part-time or full-time employee? Enough work, I guess. <laughs> yes, and then some. I'm sure we could have a whole section just devoted to this. Um, this it's such an important program, but it's one that when we have economic strife in our department, we often have to, as Kim said, make tough decisions about priorities. We would love to expand it, of course. It's really a service to the to the community and to us to get uh, folks in, like the RC track. We're just talking with those folks uh, this week about um, how energized they are again to get it going a little bit better than they have been. And it's really encouraging for us because um, it's all of our parks, it's it's our community parks. So when they get involved, uh, it just makes our parks so much better. So absolutely, we could, you know, the sky's the limit, have a whole um, section just devoted of staff just to this process. I'm sure Kim and Elio would agree. <laughs> okay. So in a non-fantasy world, back to the real world, how how possible is that within the current budget to to carve out at least a part-time position to take on that role? Well, right now the overarching budgetary instructions have been to keep a flat budget. Uh, so that makes it really difficult when we, if we're going to add somebody to the volunteer program, we are subtracting it somewhere else. Um, so we we're following those directions. It makes it really tough to try to reorganize, but um, we do at the um, executive level look at ways we can uh, find ways to stretch people or move people around to be better effective uh, at providing the services to the community. So it's very difficult. Um, I think Kim and Elio's team have done an amazing job. We all share a lot of responsibility with this program, uh, even outside the dedicated folks that they have, uh, uh, that they mentioned earlier, there's a lot of us that get involved um, kind of third party. So we really try to share the responsibility in ways that we can. Um, all of us play small roles in some way. Um, that's how we're managing it right now from a budgetary standpoint. But um, we really look to the ability to um, ask for additional needs. That's what we would need in order to fill that position. Okay. You do a great job working with what you got. Um, 
Carol, did you have a question on that? We can't hear you. I'm gonna call out Kim Hatch. Kim Hatch, didn't you used to be the volunteer coordinator? Um, so the position I took over used to be the volunteer coordinator. Um, I am now the volunteer coordinator and I do park permits. I also do tennis and pickleball. Um, I also am the backup for our, our um, data specialist. And um, I plan events like the Leprechaun Hunt and the Fairy Tale Ball I, and the Merit Award and the Craft Fair. I help with all of those. So my position is much bigger than just the volunteer program, but I could spend my whole time on the volunteer program easily. And probably your whole time on pickleball as well. Um, yeah, that's a lot, Kim. That's impressive. Um, Thank you. Thanks for that question, Carol. Uh, so just just some other some other thoughts I wanted to share. I think that um, I appreciate you explaining that taking on volunteers is uh, maybe cost neutral is a way to put it uh, or some other technical term where the amount of time you put in might be more than what we get back. But um, that could be true. And uh, but I still think it's a great public service. So, and I know that you agree with that. I know that's that's been the spirit of your presentation. Um, kind of like training an intern, often that that is almost more trouble than it's worth, but it's a great gift to that person to give them that experience, uh, to share your experience with them. So um, I appreciate that spirit. Let's let's keep that alive, that it's that it's a public um, service for all the residents of the city. Um, and hopefully we can get something out of it too. Um, I think one suggestion I wanted to share is I think you could find a lot of corporations and businesses who want to send a team. I'm thinking of like Keysight or, you know, Sonic or some of our bigger employers in town um, who do probably do that like once a year, you know, do a sort of staff cleanup, staff volunteer thing. Let's get them out there. Um, I think also, and maybe you've done all this. So if you've done it all, uh, you know, good job. But maybe reach out to some like service clubs, like Rotary, um, maybe some youth organizations. I'm thinking of like political clubs too. Uh, people like that always are looking to give back and looking for things to do usually with their members in my experience. So, um, you know, uh, if you need any help on that too, that's where you can also come to us and we can use our, uh, community contacts to to help you get connected with those folks. We're always we're always glad to help you um, help you do that. Um, those I think those were were all my thoughts. And then the other thing on outreach I wanted to say um, is yeah, let's if possible you know let's try to do more of that signage. Um, I think that was a great thing that that James did the week ahead, and maybe that's why we got a big turnout. So maybe you know, try experimenting with that. I know that's an extra job to do, um, but that turnout was impressive. So I also sort of want, was that kind of the high watermark, Kim, that you've seen like the Rincon Valley turnout? So our MLK event um, at MLK Park and our Arbor Day events always have a large turnout. They're our most popular um, okay. because people know those volunteer days. And so they're looking for volunteer opportunities. Yeah, well, that's a great point. And that's, that's, those are days people basically think of all year long that they're going to go volunteer. So, um, yeah, and I'm glad to come out. I like, I like uh, yard work. So um, I'm weird like that. Uh, okay, I think that, uh, do we have any other comments from the board? No, well, thank you again, Elio and Kim. Uh, that was great. And also, I agree with Terry. I like the presentation. I like the little headshot. It's great to get get a little picture of someone and put a face to the name. Um, so again, good job on that and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, thank you again for that. So we are gonna move on to our next agenda item, which is uh, 8.3. That is the Parks Capital Improvement Projects Budget Update. And we will be hearing uh, from research and program coordinator, Terry Bladow. Let me, Terry, please correct me if I didn't say your name right, Bladow. Um, but we Hello. can't hear you, Terry. There we Hello. go. How do we say, how do we Blado. say your name? Bladow. Okay. Thank you. So, 
Terry, please, Terry Blado, please kick it off with that update. Okay, um, hopefully they can bring my presentation up. There we go. So, um, hello board and thank you for having me. My name is Terry Blado. <laughs> um, I've been a research and parks program coordinator for parks for six and a half years now. But sorry, this is the first time you're seeing me. I'm usually buried. Um, I'm here tonight to present the capital improvements update. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay. uh, in 2021, we did various different parks projects. Uh, a new playground was put up for ages 5 through 12, was installed this winter at Culgan Creek Neighborhood Park. And this park was built using what's called a cooperative purchase agreement. So for uh, approximately $290,000, we put in a new parks playground. Um, this saved us quite a bit of money and we hope to be able to do that again going forward. Um, as part of the new playground process, we got public input and we began that back in November of 2020. We, got, uh, we sent out postcards for that and then we had our first public meeting in December of that same year. Uh, this park was officially opened by the mayor on uh, February 23rd of 2022. This does take a while. Next slide, please. In 20, uh, also of 2022 park projects, we, in August, we did, uh, we started the process of turning the Creekside Open Space Park into the Mary Traverso Open Space Park. It actually started in December of 2020 when we presented this to the DOCS and the board at that time asked us to return for further study. So in, uh, and finally, after further study in August of 21, we presented it to the city council and finally completing this renaming project process. This process was not really budgeted. Um, so funding wasn't allocated for this. This project was primarily uh, staff time that took to do this project. Next slide, please. And 2021, um, we had city council approved a grant. Uh, we applied for a grant uh, application for South Davis Park and we received uh, it. <laughs> um, this is kind of an ongoing, this is still an ongoing project. Funding for this project came from two Proposition 68 grants that the city was awarded. Both of those grants were awarded based on the census district that the park sits in. So we have a rough cost for this new uh, playground, about $490,000 to do both the design and install a new playground. As part of that process, our first community meeting was, will be held tomorrow. Um, and we encourage everybody to participate. We anticipate the construction for this project uh, to begin in the summer of 2023 and expect it to be open to the public in the winter of 23-24. Next slide, please. There is our draft concept plan for the Finley Aquatics Playground, um, which is going to replace the existing wading pool. The purpose of this proje project, in addition to updating the features, was to bring the existing pool deck up to new ADA standards. Work on this project will begin in early 2021, or work began as part of the design. We estimated that the total cost of the project will be approximately $2.3 million. I'm sorry, $3.2 million. Um, we anticipate construction for this project to begin in August of 2022, which will completely close the pool um, for, to the public uh, as we can't have both things going on at the same time. We expect the project, the pro project to be completed and reopened to the public with a new feature in May of 2023, barring any unforeseen conditions. You know how construction goes. Next slide, please. Dutch floor uh, master plan. 
um, was approved by council in January of 2022. The approximate cost for the project to do the construction is um, $2.5 million. We expect construction to begin in June of 2023 and the final park open to the public again in November of 2023. Next slide, please. Several projects. Uh, community, we received a grant from Agriculture and Open Space for a place to play community park. That is currently uh, in the process. The staff is looking forward to working with the Agriculture and Open Space District on this project. The community gardens that are were designed under Kiwana Springs Community Park uh, is part of the 2017 master plan. We anticipate construction beginning in spring of 2023. Fremont Neighborhood Park is the first stage of the master plan. This process usually takes a year or more, and the public survey has been extended to March 31st, and will extend it further if it is necessary. And I really have no other information on that project. I just hear about the budget. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is a map of the general from the 2008 general plan. For some of you, it's probably the first time you've ever seen it, and it kind of requires a little bit of explanation. So the green shadowed areas are existing parks in both city and county and state, as you can tell by the large area that is marked as Annadale. The little red trees, and it's really hard at this point to differentiate between the large trees and the small trees, but the smaller trees are neighborhood proposed neighborhood parks, and the larger trees are proposed community parks. As you can see, there's a couple proposed community parks on there. I think there's three remaining. Um, one of them we already own the land for. So this document does need to be updated to show that we already have the land for some of these proposed parks and that there's, they have not yet started the master planning stage. Next slide, please. This is our park development impact fee zone map. And this map shows how park funds are allocated. Each zone comes, come, each zone's funds come from the building permits for all of the new developments that happen in that year. These funds are used for new park land and to make significant improvements to existing parks. These funds are collected by the finance department and then they're distributed to each zone. So if not enough building is done in one zone over another one, the funding amounts are substantially different. And this year's an obvious, um, re, uh, it's very obvious this year. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the proposed and existing budget for the park development impact fees for the Northwest Quadrant. So at this time, we have these four projects placed as available, uh, as ready to build, funds available ready to build. So there are all of them, all of these four projects are in some assemblance of the process. They're either under the master planning stage or they've had um, the master planning stage is completed and they're under the design stage or some are even ready for construction. At this point, we have in the existing funds for zone one, $5.9 million. In the allocated funds for next year, which is the funds that came from this last year's construction or development, built new, uh, new, new homes in those areas, we have uh, only received $1.2 million in this zone. So we are allocating, we're requesting to allocate that funding towards the Finley Aquatic Center project so that we can build that in this year. So the total existing and available funds that are allocated for zone one is this $7.2 million amount. Next slide, please. 
increase. And in zone two, the Southwest Quadrant uh, Park Development Fund, we have five major projects going on at this time. We have small projects going on at Bear Park. We're in a holding pattern for Roseland Creek. South Davis is slated to happen next year. We're putting money together for a potential project at Southwest Community Park. And we are um, holding funds for play equipment in the Southwest generally. Those, those funds uh, add up to approximately $3.5 million. In, in zone two, we've received for the 2023 budget year, um, $1.8 million from development impact fees, which we have, which we would like to allot to South Davis Neighborhood Park and to the Southwest Play Zone Equipment Fund. So the total amount of funds available for this zone, taking the, the existing and the proposed, we come up with $5.3 million roughly. Next slide, please. In zone three, we only have slated for two projects in this zone. Uh, one is the potential for doing Fremont Park at a later date and the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens project, which we anticipate uh, happening here in the next year. So we only have available for this zone um, $1.5 million and our allotment that came in was rather small from this area, not enough building going on. So we've got, we only have an allocation of um, under a million dollars. So our grand total for both the allocation and the development fees for the year is about $2.4 million. Next slide, please. In zone four, we have six major projects going on or that we're trying to get funding for. We're trying to finish up Colgan Creek Park. Um, I think that bill just hasn't come because this is information from February. We have Galvin Community Park, so we have some work to, to slate out there. Um, Kiwanis at Tokay, Peter Springs Southeast Play Equipment, and Kiwanis Springs Community Park, which I believe is the gardens. So we have $3.7 million existing in that zone and our allocation that we've got from new PDI funds is $469,000, uh, which we'd like to allot to Southwest Play Equipment. Next slide, please. In, it, in addition to funding from PDIs, we have some non-developmental fee sources. So we have some funds that came from the trust fund for Railroad Square that we're holding for a major improvement at that location. Um, trust funds are just one-time fees that we, once they're spent, they're gone. In the Southeast Quadrant, we're getting, we have some funds for uh, Howarth Park to improve the ADA access to both the loading dock and the fishing pier. The ADA funds um, are allotted by city council at, at, as a annual allotment and we are not, we don't get to pick which project they do, they decide which project they do. These are the projects that we have thrown into their list. So we're not sure when they're gonna happen. Um, in our Northwest Quadrant, we also have an ADA project for the Rincon Valley Community Dog Park, which gets us the pathway to the small dog park. And that'll complete that project and that access is, that'll give us access to both dog parks in that location. Other funding for uh, in the Northwest Quadrant is the Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. The general fund is giving us uh, 995,000 for uh, the project to replace the roof. And that should happen this year. And then citywide, we have two projects, the um, fire damage lands roadway landscaping design and construction. And we have the six fire damaged park project. 
Both of those are covered by FEMA dollars, Cal OES dollars, Santa Rosa Park Foundation's donations, and Measure M. The amount there is the whole part, the whole dollar value of the project, not the amount that we that allotted from anything specific. Um, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, so as a summary, and I probably went way too fast <laughs> for most of you, um, the park development impact fees in zone one, we have an existing amount of 5.9 million. We'd like to, this year's allotted funding is 1.2, and we'd like to allot that to the Finley Aquatics Playgrounds so we can complete that project. Our zone two funding, we have we would like to allocate uh, 848,000 to South Davis and a million dollars to uh, the Southwest Play Zone equipment and add that to our existing budget amount for five, to have a total of $5.3 million. In zone three, um, we'd like to allocate the park development impact fees to the Fremont Park project. Uh, which is set at a later date. And in zone four, we would like to take the $469,000 and allocate it to the Southwest Park uh, Playground Equipment Project. So our total budget for just the park development impact fee accounts is $19,235,000. That's a lot of numbers to to grind. Next slide. Any questions? Thank you, Terry. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the board before we go to public comment and board comments? Okay, I had a few questions, Terry. Um, for the railroad square one, is that did and I'm not trying to just correct you here. Was that Depot Park that you're referring to is getting improvements? Or was that like the, the neighborhood itself? I wasn't clear on that. That's the Railroad Square Improvement District. So that's not park specific. That's a trust fund that the uh, merchants hold for that area. So it's not okay. really allotted to the park itself. Great. Thank you. Um, and there weren't any non-development fees allocated for the Southwest Quadrant. Are there other funding sources? Or maybe I missed that slide. Sorry, um, um, you mean development impact fees? Uh, the non-development fee source there, didn't have any listed for Southwest. That's correct. There aren't any at this time for Southwest. That would be anything that comes from the general fund or any sort of trust fund or any ADA funding. Okay. So for example, Roseland Creek, is that have other funding sources outside of the general fund or outside of these listed? Right now it's only funding source is the CDI fund. Okay. I guess I it seemed unusual that that quadrant wouldn't be on there, but I'm assuming I'm, I'm trusting that we're finding other fund sources and that's why we're not using those funds. Correct. We have other okay. funding sources. Okay. So that was just a um, list to give you information as to what other sources we have in addition to the park development impact fees. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, and then just another question. I, uh, there, the general plan update is happening right now. And I just, I looked through it and there isn't really a mention of any parks in there at all, other than very generic at the beginning. Uh, and I, I'm not saying we need a bunch of new parks, but is that part of the general plan? Oh, defer that Our question again. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, uh, I can so, jump in there if you, if you ahead, want. Yeah. We, Right now we have in the current general plan some information about parks, but it's relatively dated like a lot of the information in the general plan. So with the update, we are looking at 
uh, working with planning and economic development to look at different designations that are more suitable for the types of parks we now have in the city versus what we had um, back in the day. We have um, Courthouse Square, which is kind of floating. Is it a park, plaza, you know, what, what is it? So we just wanna get some distinction there as part of that process. And we've had early initial conversations with planning and economic development, but we want the public process to happen. And then we're gonna circle back uh, to see what comes out of that as well and uh, work on a more hefty update um, once the public process um, it's once we have a good um, feedback from the public process uh, regarding parks, it should be um, full of parks at that time. <laughs> okay, great. I'll, so I have a comment. I'll save my comment, but um, thank you for that explanation. Uh, do we have any other questions from the board? Carol, go ahead. Uh, first, um, a couple comments. In going what? by um, South Davis, I, I looked at the play structure and it's like, you know, this play structure doesn't look bad compared to some of the others. I now learned that that revenue source is coming from a different pocket. Is that correct? Uh, and I'm hoping um, at the meeting tomorrow night, staff will somehow address that. I, I fear that other neighborhoods are going to say, well, what about us? Our, our stuff is falling apart. And and theirs looks like it could actually go someplace else. But I understand that now. And I think that's um, valuable educational information to um, potentially share with taxpayers. Um, a question, I, and one more statement. I'm just going to come right out and say, these budget slides just confuse the hell out of me. And I try to go along. I'm hoping we could have a little primer where one easy slide is broken down a little bit further. I don't know if anybody else was challenged by it. It's like, oh. I feel like I missed at Econ 1A because this is just totally over my head. I don't know what's real money, what's looked for money, but, but that's something perhaps that could be um, addressed. And last but not least, if there could be a review of impact fees on single family houses versus apartment buildings versus um, low income slash subsidized housing, which I know um, we're, the city's making a huge effort at addressing, is an impact fee applied to each one of those separate dwellings? And if so, how does that slide around? Thank you. So Carol, to answer your one question that I heard in there about the South Davis Park, yes, the funds were specifically for just a couple of census districts, and we had to find the census districts that had a park in them that said that we could use those funds. And we only had, I believe, two choices, and the other one was not available at this time. I believe the other choice was Bear Park, and that made no sense to do new playground equipment in a brand new park. So that's why this project was done in that park. Terry, can you also, is it possible to break down the impact fees by housing type? I believe we could probably get that data from finance. I do not have it. Okay. Right. It's going to it's going to take a while, though, uh, that the board could have uh, patience while we gather that it's not something we collect or are privy to. It's all coming from finance and finance is very busy right now with the budget. So um, I'm sure we can get that for you um, sooner than later. I, I, I'll withdraw that request. I don't think that's <laughs> worth spending quality time on, but um, maybe some generalities is uh, an apartment building. Which one shall we use? Let's use the one that's going in at the old Prickett's nursery site. Will the per unit impact fee on, let's say it's a hundred units, be half of a hundred unit subdivision? Will it, would it be a tenth? Uh, do you guys have any feel for, for that? I would say that it's really dependent on the cost of the construction. So it's a percentage of the cost of the construction for all fees in the city. 
So it really depends on how many, how many units are being constructed and uh, what is the price range of those units? Are they market rate or, or, or what? But um, it's, it's right now um, somewhat dependent on, on, on that process. Uh, but we can get back to you with some of the details uh, from the code. Please don't spend heroic effort for me on this. Okay, thank you, Carol. Steve, do you have any questions? I just have a question regarding the non-development fee sources, uh, specifically the 6.8 million that was uh, allocated to citywide that was funded by FEMA and Major, Measure M. Uh, do we have a general feeling about where those funds are being uh, spent, which part of the city? Yes, we know exactly where those are going. Um, that construction project will um, rebuild the landscaping features in several of our communities that were burned, um, specifically up in Fountain Grove and in Coffee Park neighborhood. So that's the grand total cost of the project. We're not going to fund all that. Most of that will come from FEMA. We'll probably end up with a 6% of that cost as the city's piece. Were there any funds allocated to Sonoma Highway uh, in the uh, Southeast District? Not from this fire. There might be some from the glass fire, but because the, that highway is Caltrans property, it would not come to us. Hmm. There's a city owned property along the, uh, the west side of Sonoma Highway uh, near Oakmont that was burned. You're speaking about the right of way near yes. right at the intersection? Uh, it goes all the way up to uh, the Anoka property. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I'd have to look into it. <laughs> That's, that's most likely, um, Board Member Spillman, um, right away, and the right away is the responsibility of the adjacent homeowners. There's only a tiny portion of the near the entry of Oakmont that is the city's responsibility for maintenance. So um, guessing, <laughs> that's probably dangerous, but guessing that's mostly um, the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So in 2008, the city dedicated all right away responsibility for maintenance back to the adjacent property owners. Um, so we'd have to look at it and we can, but it's, I, if I'm recalling correctly, I think that's the area is belonging to those adjacent property owners. Thank you. And, and just to clarify on that, so these are the FEMA reimbursements or grants, I'm not sure exactly how that how arrived. Those are for the 2017 Tubbs fire, right, Terry? That's correct. Yeah, so we're not yet, to the point of fixing other stuff if it needs to be fixed, but um, it takes a while to get a check from FEMA, if, if I remember correctly. It does, several years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Terry, go ahead. I just had a quick question um, with regard to the CALA report and um, how that might impact the PDI allocations for 22-23, Are will there be any, um, relationship between that report and these projects that are listed. Would you like me to jump in, Terry? Yes. <laughs> uh, the, cal the calendar report is not likely to um, uh, change any of the current allocations significantly. So these are allocations we were uh, really hoping to see at a larger dollar amount to support the things we're doing now. Uh, so the calendar, uh, the calendar's condition assessment that'll come out soon um, is likely, most likely to affect the 2024 budget, as well as we'll start off using straight measure M funds to get things rolling. Great. Thank you. Uh, Terry, oh, one last question for me, and then I'll go to you, Carol. Why did the Mary Traverso open space, why was that a capital project? Is that a sign replacement? Um, we did not do any cap. We didn't uh, do any capital work there. We just included it for your information that it was a completed okay. project. Great, Carol, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to loop back around to 
Econ 1A that I didn't attend, obviously. I'm looking at the budget sum summary. Maybe we could go back to that at slide 15 of 16. Great. Does all of this money currently exist? Yes. And it is earmarked. It is locked down for these projects. Yes. Great. Thank you. That would be as soon as the city council approves it. Correct. Right, Terry? <laughs> yeah. Correct. Great. I can't do anything without their approval. Yep. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that question, Carol. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay, host, do we have any public comments on agenda item 8.3? No, we don't have any hands raised. Okay, now we'll uh, go to any comments or opinions folks have on that presentation from the board. I'll just share my one that I that I hinted at. Uh, let's definitely get into the general plan update. Um, I think that uh, it's very housing focused, which is great. We need to focus on that in the city. But um, I, let's yeah. So you said you're doing that, Jen. Uh, just maybe loop us back in in the future in some point as to how we're interacting with that. That'd be great. Absolutely, yeah. It needs it needs a hefty update for the park section. Okay. Yeah, that's in my. Uh, in my mayor's lunch too a little bit so all right thank you everyone thank you terry very much for running us through the numbers um appreciate your expertise on that thank you yeah okay uh we are now on to committee reports and i guess that's me just heading right into the mayor's lunch um so the mayor's lunch had a few updates that relate to us. So just want to talk about the general plan update because it is a big deal. Um, and it will involve parks in the future, as we just heard. I went out to a meeting um, last night of that they did at the Central Library. And there was a pretty good turnout of about 30 members of the public. And um, there's a workbook you can get. It was at the Park a Month cleanup. So I appreciated seeing the planning staff out there. And that's a big job of uh, the Planning Commission right now when they eventually get that uh, approved. Um, so go tech, check that out. There's a website that everyone can go to. Uh, it's really easy. It's just called Santa Rosa forward, uh, dot com. Uh, and then you can check out the, the general plan update there. Um, another update, uh, we talked about this last month, but the board of public utilities is still looking at, uh, drought issues and how that will affect, uh, a lot of different city, uh, services and functions. Um, obviously we're still, still not getting enough rain. So, um, we're not, I don't believe we're at the point yet where they have even gotten to stage four. Maybe we're at that, but stage five is, is the bad one. That's when there's a housing moratorium and a lot of other unforeseen consequences approved, uh, about 30 years ago. So it's likely the city council very likely will try to modernize that a little bit, um, and make it more more applicable to the current state of the city. Uh, the other one is charter review. So that's, that's also a committee I'm on and we're uh, chugging along on that. We're kind of in um, the technical part of it, which uh, we need a good name. We're calling it the modernization and cleanup. So this is a lot of uh, various things like changing the word citizen to resident. Uh, I think there might even still be some gendered terms in the city charter. So there's that sort of stuff. And then there's some bigger picture stuff. Um, we're looking at a two year budget cycle related to what we've been talking about. So that's possible in our future. We may just give the council the option of doing that. Um, and then they could basically change it mid in the middle of that two years. But uh, a lot of city governments use that. Apparently our city manager came from a city that used that. So, um, that'll be explored. It definitely helps on the staff time end. Um, and there's still a lot of public engagement involved. So yeah, go check that out. The city council gave us 12 items. So we've, we've been uh, whittling that list down. Um, the other big update uh, I'll save for Carol, um, and that is our waterways update. Uh, let's see, I think that was everything for me. Let me just check my notes real quick. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, that's everything for me. So Carol, would you like to provide the waterways committee report? 
please? So I didn't really have any rabbits up my hat. Um, I can tell you Prince Memorial Greenway, we're still discussing the fencing around the Hyatt and I don't know if it's coming back to us or not, but it's definitely bringing a, um, it's highlighting the importance of Prince Memorial Greenway. Um, Terry Bladow showed up and gave a very interesting in how convoluted the uh, sections of the land at Prince Memorial is be private, Jen, I know you're shaking, you're nodding your head, private, county, city, street maintenance, park maintenance. Um, everybody wants it to be uh, the feather in our community cap that it can be. And this, um, this project that the Hyatt is proposing, I really don't think they expected it was going to be quite as, um, not that it's controversial, but it's opened a lot of can of worms that are really worth addressing. So um, I guess I'm real grateful for them for that, but it is uh, ongoing work in progress that is uh, incorporating a lot of different elements within the county. And there's no meeting tomorrow. So that's it. Yeah, and just from the from the mayor's side, he met with the Hyatt folks and uh, did not did not like their idea um, to put up the big old fence. Uh, I actually didn't know there was even a public plaza there until Steve told us that in the meeting. And I've used that pathway a million times, and I had no idea that there's some sort of city-owned courtyard or something behind the Hyatt uh, that's right adjacent to the bridge to um, to the park that's across the creek. So I'm going to go check that out. Maybe that'll be my next new park. Um, right now, there's really no public use of that, at least uh, in any sort of formal sense. So yeah, um, I think that was it from the mayor's lunch. Uh, thank you, Carol, for covering that. It's uh, definitely an important uh, part of the city's uh, parks portfolio. OK, moving on. Uh, Deputy Director Santos, do we have any written or electronic communications for item 10? None this month. Great, that's easy. Um, on to item 11, any future agenda items? Uh, would any board members like to suggest uh, a future agenda item for us to look at? Okay, um, I had I had a few. Uh, just just oh, I already did the parks in the journal plan update. Cross that off. Um, can we possibly, Jen, get some sort of update as BPU moves through that uh, drought process on how that would affect city parks and uh, rec sites? I've I've had people ask me that, and I don't I don't have a great answer for them. Um, is that a possible agenda item for the future? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we will keep you updated. We're we're in constant contact with the water department for what ifs kind of scenarios, and and we're doing the same thing. Um, so we don't have an exact answer right this moment, but we are formulating options for ourselves. Like what would it, what would that mean for us? Right now we're in a we're okay. Uh, cutting back. Um, you may have noticed some dry spots out there as the maintenance team was talked to you about um, earlier this year, but um, any further restrictions could could change things for us. So we'll, we'll definitely keep uh, this board updated. Thank you. Um, and then the other one that I'm hoping we can eventually get, and maybe it's already on the schedule, is a presentation from the Diversity, Equi Equity, and Inclusion uh, Officer, uh, Socorro Shields. We, you know, you referenced that in, in some things we've done, and I think Socorro's planning to do that for every board and in, in commission. Um, but maybe if you could just just ask for us to, to get on that schedule in the next few months, I think it'd be helpful for everyone. Absolutely, yes, I did mention this to the assistant city manager uh, and they were being discussed, but I, I believe that was what I remember hearing that they were planning to get out and about to boards and commissions when they were at that stage. And so I would love for them to be here to have that conversation with y'all. Great. Sounds like it's in the works. Um, 
Any other, that's it for me. Any other future agenda items from any other board members? All right, seeing none, uh, that is on to adjournment. So with that, we will be adjourning the meeting. Uh, the next regular scheduled meeting of the board will be Wednesday, April 27th at 4 p.m. Like I said, I'm planning to be there, but uh, I don't know if that'll be possible internationally. So Steve, we'll be in touch, don't worry. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for your time today. Uh, with that, I will adjourn this meeting of the Board of Community Services at 6.22 p.m. Thank you, everyone.